Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we have got a really interesting show today because we're going to be talking about coping styles of loss because people cope in different ways, right? Absolutely. And I'm excited to hear about the different ways. And we actually have someone on that has looked at the themes and patterns in the research and is going to tell us about all the different ways that people cope after loss. All right. Would you want to introduce her to us, Heidi? Yes. Um, So today we're going to talk with Dr. Erica Goldblatt. Um, Dr. Erica Goldblatt-Hyatt is the Assistant Director of the Doctorate of Social Work at Rutgers University. He is an administrator, clinician, and an author specializing in death, dying, and bereavement. And she wrote the self-help book for bereaved teen siblings, which is wonderful, and it's called Grieving for the Sibling You Lost. So welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to have you on the show today. I know that uh, there hasn't been a lot written on teen grief, a lot on kids' grief, but not a lot. We did write a book for uh, parents uh, for uh, who have grieving teens, but this is directly a book for teens, right? Yes, it is. And, you know, this is a group that's often referred to as forgotten mourners um, and have referred to themselves in the research as forgotten mourners because sometimes parents are coping with the loss of their child and understandably they may be less available for siblings that are also grieving a loss. So it's also sometimes called a dual loss. Siblings that survive really feel like they've not only lost their brother or sister, but they've also lost a parent. So I think it's really important that we recognize this group and um, shed some light on how they cope and see how we can help them. All right. So uh, you were saying that you found that um, the coping styles that you found in your dissertation of studying teens are across the board for many people, you're finding those styles. I thought that was interesting, didn't you, Hyde? Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And I love, Erica, you know, we met years ago when you were doing your dissertation because I did my dissertation on the sudden death of a sibling. And what struck me and what I found so incredible about you is that although you're not a brief sibling, you really understood the intensity and the importance of the sibling bond and the sibling relationship. And you really wanted to take this on. Um, so as my mom said, you studied various coping styles, right? And themes and patterns and the way that people coped. Yes. And, and you know, I, I, I do want to say that I, I really, um, I understand that not every couple is capable of having a chi- uh, more than one child. And so it's, it's a blessing to have a sibling in your life. And uh, there are also individuals who have relationships with extended family or close friends uh, that feel like siblings. So I, I think it's important to acknowledge that Uh, the definition of sibling, although we traditionally see it as people that are born and raised together, it doesn't have to be that familial bond. But, you know, traditionally, when we look at siblings, um, the research and our own experiences tell us how formative that bond is, how um, they are sometimes our first rivals, our first disciplinarians. Uh, They are our, certainly in my case, uh, our co-conspirators. Um, I was the baby of my family, so being the youngest of three, I was able to get away with more, and I was often the subject of much ire and frustration from my older siblings. So, um, you know, as, as I've grown, I've been able to experience a maturing relationship with my siblings. And so, of course, um, when I started working in the area of pediatric oncology, I started working with teenagers who unfortunately lost their brother or sister. And, um, what I what I was kind of fascinated by was it's so it's such a delicate time of life as we're figuring out who we are and what we want to be and what do our relationships mean and um, how do we how do we cope and and the research revealed to me some really interesting coping styles that uh, directly apply to these grieving teens I was working with but I've also seen um, really ap- apply to death across the lifespan. Mm-hmm. So um, there are a couple styles that I identified and um, I'll, I'll list them and then I can explain each more with a, a little bit more detail. So I call them in my book, um, the old soul, 
Um, there's the replacement, there's the runaway, and there is the rubber band. And I, I should say that I think since I've done my dissertation, uh, the research has expanded and there's probably many more coping styles, but I think these four uh, are good to focus on because they kind of give us an idea of how, um, how people grieve. So the first is uh, the old soul, and these are teens, but also individuals that um, kind of take on a lot when somebody dies. So they often, if you're looking at a teenager, they might almost look like a parent. They might assume control of household chores and duties. They might um, really want to appear as though they are coping very well. And so oftentimes people, significant others in that child's life may say, oh, you know, you're, you're really mature. You're dealing with this really well. When actually inside they feel that they have to step in for their parents because their parents may be absent or may be emotionally unavailable. So you'll see these kids that are making funeral arrangements, that are accepting well wishes, that are parenting younger siblings that have um, survived that need, that extra um, adult figure in their life. So uh, we call these old souls and uh, they can really struggle with feeling like no one is really paying attention to their struggles as they try to support the family. Well, what's interesting about this, Erica, is two things. One is that, you know, oftentimes um, siblings are told to be strong for their parents yeah. because their parents have been through the worst loss. And it's not the parents that are saying that, it's society. Yeah. And so, you know, the old soul I could see really taking that seriously and saying, okay, I've got to step it up. And the other thing is parents are constantly saying to me, why are my teens not grieving in front of me? Why won't they grieve in front of me? It makes me so angry. And I always say, because they're trying to be good kids. They don't want to cause you any more pain. And I think of the old soul as really taking on, like, I don't want to cause my parents any more pain because they have had enough to deal with, with the death of my sibling. Yes, very well said. And I, I do think that point about society is well taken, especially when you're a teenager and you're really looking for cues from society about what is what is cool and what is normal and what is appropriate. So it's understandable that you would be internalizing those messages of kind of keeping it together for everyone else. But I, I also think we can apply this to people across the lifespan. Um, even adult grievers that lose siblings or that lose significant others, there's this kind of idea of just being strong and that kind of mature way of dealing with grief is to push forward and continue your rituals and routines and, and not to really stop because um, the emotions may be so painful and overwhelming that you don't want to appear as traditionally weak. So that kind of old soul, that burden that an adult griever may feel, I think is also um, representative of this type of coping style. I love that. And then we've got the replacement. Yes, so these are um, teens. And, and again, what's interesting is as I work in my community with teens experiencing different types of losses now, I'm actually seeing this as well. So you can imagine that in the case of a bereaved sibling, sometimes the surviving sibling may feel like the wrong child died. And, and again, these are internalized messages. I think there are you know, very few people that will explicitly say the wrong child died or, oh, I wish this person didn't die and that you had died. Of course not. You know, adults and caregivers in the lives of a surviving teen uh, care about them and, and love them. So sometimes, though, the child receives a message, especially if um, the child that died was uh, particularly popular or uh, stood out in school or in community or just the way that the family chooses to remember the child that died, um, these teens may feel like the wrong child died. And so uh, what they do is they take on the attributes and the characteristics of that brother or sister that passed away, adopting the same friend group, um, perhaps uh, keeping their legacy alive by changing their own college or educational trajectory. Um, and, and again, you know, this isn't always um, unhealthy. It's not always a bad way to cope. And, and so I, I don't want to say that there's a wrong or a right way to grieve, but it, it's notable that sometimes a teen might kind of suppress their own individuality and try to remind others um, of the sibling that passed away. And, and I think that can be healthy. That can be, again, preserving a, a legacy or a relationship. Or sometimes it can really feel like, hey, no one's really seeing that I'm still here and that I have something of value to offer too and that I'm, I'm grieving. 
and, and again, I, I think we can see this across the adult lifespan too, that uh, people want to rush in and, and fill that hole of grief uh, with um, taking on characteristics or hobbies or interests of the person that died. That's interesting because I remember Heidi saying, uh, has said to me more than once that because uh, Scott was the only boy that she felt like the wrong child died. So sometimes uh, teens can have that feeling, internal feeling, when they're not be giving, being given that message. They give it to themselves. So let's go on to the runaway. Well, let okay. me talk about the replacement really quick and say something. Um, yeah. I, yes, I, I, I mean, when my brother died, I definitely felt like the wrong child died. Because as you said, Erica, he was extremely popular and he was an incredible athlete and varsity in numerous sports mm -hmm. and just everybody loved him. Um, and he was the, my only brother. I had two, we have three, there's three girls in the family and we kind of circled around him like the, like the star of our family before he died. Um, so we definitely, I definitely felt like the wrong child died for many years. I thought it was a strange thing to feel and I didn't really share it with many people until I got around other brief siblings and heard that this was a common theme. And mm -hmm. it was a very big relief to me to realize that there was nothing wrong with me and that this was a normal thing. Um, so I love that. And the other thing I always say to parents is, please don't ever say life is no longer worth living because then you will make us the siblings that are still alive. Your children that are still living feel like we're not enough. Well said. And you know what I, I want to add as well, again, um, there are, there are teens that are experiencing all kinds of losses or transitions in their identities that may choose to emulate role models. Um, so one of my areas of practice now is with teens that are coming out as queer, LGBTQ, and sometimes they will adopt um, this replacement mentality. They will find someone who they feel is safe to take on those characteristics because they don't yet feel secure in themselves and their identity. So I think this is something that really is, is pervasive across adolescents as they try to figure out who am I? And, and losing, whether it's an element of yourself, your understanding of yourself, or a sibling, I think we really need to honor that um, they're looking to others to help them understand themselves and their own individuality. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the runaway. I mean, these are so fascinating. <laughs> whole show on just one. Go ahead. Yes, yes. So if you can imagine kind of the typical, the stereotypical teen, it is certainly a hallmark of adolescence to uh, engage in perhaps more uh, risky behaviors, whether that's truancy from school, um, experimenting with substances, hanging out with different and perhaps more dangerous groups. Um, really that testing is how we figure out our comfort level and boundaries and, and again, a sense of ourselves and who we are. Um, in the case of the runaway, these are teens that really kind of dive into these risky behaviors and uh, really end up in a little bit more trouble than we would want them to be in because uh, they're, again, trying to cope by throwing themselves into a different, a different identity, a different style, and, and in a way they're running away from their process of grief. Um, sometimes this happens with really traumatic losses where the memory of the of the grief or of, of the way that the sibling died is just too painful and uh, so so they're really trying to distract themselves unfortunately we know from the research and from clinical practice that the best way to cope with the traumatic loss is to actually be exposed and, and walk with um, guidance through the memory of it and to process it cognitively in our minds and in our emotions uh, because if we don't we, we run away we suppress that trauma and then it pops up in other places and you're, um, you're at risk for drugs alcohol sex exactly truancy high-risk sexual behaviors all of that stuff self-medicating and you know the other thing is with the whole runaway idea is that um and i love this when your sibling dies you it question it puts your own mortality into question because it's a peer and you're like, oh my gosh, my brother died, I could die. Life is not forever. It is, it is like so shocking on so many levels when a sibling dies. Um, so yeah, I can understand the idea of wanting to run away from how they died and what happened, et cetera. Um, it's scary. It's so frightening to go in those places and yet it's so important to be with safe people so that you can explore that. Yes. So, Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's get to our next, our last one, the rubber band. 
I love yes, that. Yes, these are the rubber bands. So you can imagine, <laughs> you know, a rubber band stretches and it snaps back into place. And what's great news is that uh, the majority of teens and actually the majority of us that are grieving a loss, we are rubber bands. We actually fall into sometimes the old soul, sometimes the replacement, sometimes the runaway, and we explore ways to cope that are pretty normal and healthful um, along the grieving process. Sometimes we feel like we're stretched to capacity and we may feel acute and strong emotions, um, but ultimately we snap back into shape. And what's really important about um, these rubber bands or their, their resilient coping is that they have, as you said, you know, safe people around them. Um, if parents aren't available, if there's a pastor, if there's a teacher, if there's a guidance counselor, if there are healthy individuals that encourage talking, that, it, that really will walk on the path of the grief journey with a teen or really any other griever, then they are capable of snapping back into place and actually being a little more, um, a little wiser, a little more seasoned because of their loss. And so I think it's really, well, well, again, we tend to kind of pathologize and make into illness these coping styles. I don't want to do that. I want to say that actually it's very normal for us to stretch into these different categories and ultimately snap back into a better sense of, of who we are and, and move forward resiliently um, as a human being. Mm, I love that. Yeah, that is great. Well, listen, thank you so much for being on our show today. And tell us uh, your book again, how people can get a hold of you. Yes, I have it right okay. here. This is uh, Grieving for the Sibling You Lost, A Teen's Guide to Coping with Grief and Finding Meaning After Loss. It's available on Amazon.com, uh, Barnes and Nobles, or through my publisher, which is New Harbinger, which is a wonderful self-help uh, publisher. And really, they focus on um, making sure there are resources for teens um, in, their, in their offerings of, of books. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you again for being on the show and for all the great work you've done. I love the research and uh, the idea. I love the rubber band idea that uh, no matter what our losses are, we can, we'll go to different areas, but we can be resilient and come back. And thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Erica, thank you so much for building so much awareness for a very marginalized group, and that is Brief Siblings and for doing the research and the important work you're doing. And I endorsed your book and I love it. I would highly recommend it. And uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to having you on our cable show. Me as well, thank you. And thanks for watching and listening to this show today. And Heidi and I will hope that you will visit us at Open to Hope where we have all sorts of resources for you. And we also wanna remind you that if you lost hope, please lean on us until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.